You're listening to Cloud9, where Bahaiteachings.org interviews artists from around the globe to learn about what inspires, uplifts, and motivates them to make a positive contribution to the world. My name is Shadi Talui Wallace. Sky Glavish is one of Canada's leading artists. Several museums, galleries, and public spaces across Canada are home to his collections, including the National Gallery of Canada. He's known for his provocative work, challenging assumptions, questioning notions of self, and searching for truth. In a career that spanned over 30 years, Sky has moved from painting to sculpture to woodwork weaving and textiles. I also read that he's been known to draw with both hands simultaneously, sometimes sketching with his eyes closed. Born on the remote island of Alert Bay, on the west coast of Canada, Skye lived a pretty epic and tumultuous life until his early 20s when he enrolled at the University of Saskatchewan. Today, Skye lives and works in London, Ontario, where he is an associate professor at Western University. He holds a BFA from the University of Saskatchewan and an MFA from the University of Alberta. In this episode of Cloud9, we'll delve more into Sky's early years and learn about his father's journey to becoming a Baha'i and how this influences his life and work today. Sky will walk us through some of his provocative exhibitions, one that includes a giant image in graphite that reads, Have you heard of Baha'u'llah? and another that features a seven-foot banner proclaiming the words, Say all are created by God. We close by exploring the spiritual aspects of Sky's creative process and also some of his thoughts on the current health pandemic that the world is facing. Sky Glabish, a warm welcome to you from us at Cloud9. Hello. <laughs> I want to start off by talking about a trip that you just returned from. You were recently in Guyana, where you were invited by Dr. O'Toole, who runs the School of Nations, to explore the role of art with incarcerated men. Could you describe some of the conditions of your visit in more detail, highlights of your time with these men, and maybe some of the transformations that you witnessed? Um, and really what you took away from this experience. Sure. Thanks uh, for having me. And yeah, I was invited by Dr. O'Toole actually a little while ago to go to Guyana to participate in a conference, which was looking at the relationship between social and economic development and art. And all of this is done through the lens of community building and social transformation that the School of Nations is really, really involved with in Guyana and Georgetown. Um, and of course, Dr. O'Toole is, is a well-known figure in, in Guyana, and he is a b- member of the Baha'i faith. And he said, um, things have changed, and I'm wondering if you would be willing to work on a project that we are currently exploring on um, bringing some of these ideas into the prisons in Guyana. And I sort of, you know, I didn't, jump at the opportunity, but I didn't say no. I just thought, well, that's interesting. I I was really perplexed by that. But I just said, yeah, sure, whatever you want me to do. So we went together, Ted Glavish and and, and me, my dad. Just being in Georgetown itself was a little bit um, of a shock to the system because on one hand, it was kind of a bit dangerous, but on the other hand, the people were just amazing. Like, Like really almost hard to describe how how kind and and radiant and thoughtful and courteous and just beautiful actually the people in in Guyana are so there was this really strong contrast between the people and then the conditions of the society or the city itself the first prison we went into is this one called uh, Tamari prison and the men that were there were mostly young young guys um, but they were like in for real sentences like you know, anything from robbery to murder or whatever. When we got to Tamari prison, I had absolutely no idea what to expect. And when we got there, it was basically like a classroom. And all the men were sitting in these little desks that were like too small for them, like almost like children's desks. And it was kind of like, it it just emphasized the, the space between us, like us as outsiders and, you know, foreigners coming to teach them something and them sitting in these little desks and 
and they're all, a lot of them are big men and covered in tattoos and stuff. So, um, one of the things that I, I want to do right away is to break down that, that distance between us. And so I asked the guards, you know, I, I have some ideas. I hope it's okay. Can we put these desks away and just bring out some proper tables and have everybody sit together at tables? So that was the, the first thing. And then, um, Actually, they began the day with prayers, and the prayers were just said from from the heart. Right then, it kind of set the tone. And then, and basically, what I what I was suggesting to the prisoners was, um, let's look at art as a language, um, as a way of expressing expressing something, rather than just about imagery, like just about. Um, drawing like a picture of a, of a flower or, 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 or a landscape or something. So the first, the first round of exercises was really to um, get them to free, free up a little bit and to loosen up. And so they were very much just improvisational kind of exercises that had to do with the way the paint would, would bleed and, and certain things would act as a resist like crayon or oil pastel would, would act as a resist with the ink. And it was just very abstract and loose and fun. And, and it was amazing how they got, they got really into it. Um, like they just, whatever you would suggest, they would just, you know, they would just do it and they would try it. And so they started making all these really beautiful kind of abstract paintings. Um, and I actually posted a lot of those on Instagram and, and sold them for $50 each to anybody who, who was interested to raise money for, for this program and actually s- to send it to the prisoners. And then the next day we came back and we, we gave them a little bit of direction, but we also said, you're free to sort of do your own thing. And then anybody that wanted to, I said, why don't we work together on a painting? So me and about eight other uh, men uh, did some drawings of the prison and the prison yard. And then we brought these drawings inside and we made a large painting collaboratively with, from these drawings. And that was a pretty incredible moment, um, a really beautiful moment. And then after two days with those guys, I went to another prison called Lusignan Prison, which is uh, a, a bigger facility. Um, the men we met that we, we met there were different. They were older for the most part. They were the men were just extremely um, kind and and warm, and they were real brothers. Um, and when they get together and sing, it's just like it, it's hard to put into words just how powerful it is. And so they were, we were alternating between this worship that they do, these prayers, and then we would do some art, and then we get together and sing and play music. One of the main principles of the Baha'i faith is this concept of the oneness of humanity and that the purpose of, of the Baha'i faith is really to promote this idea of, of oneness and to promote this idea of unity. But in all of my days as a Baha'i and areas in which I found myself and and serving and just alongside of other, other people and other groups, I've never experienced that level of unity before. It was the highest level of, of fraternity and brotherly love and unity that I, I've ever experienced. So that says something about the condition of the men in that prison, um, the condition of their souls. And it made me realize that um, what we think of as freedom is really, um, of course it is, it, we do have a lot of freedom, but, but it comes at a price. And, and one of the prices of that freedom is we're very distracted and we're very atomized. Uh, everybody's in their own sort of cocoon. And, um, and when you have to rely on 10 or 12 other men, uh, really for your survival and for your spiritual identity and your, um, just in a sense, to give your life meaning and structure, the bonds of friendship and love and unity that, that they created were just absolutely, it was like being in paradise. And my dad and I both felt the same way. Like we felt like as Baha'is, they really set a, a much high, a extremely high standard for what this concept of unity could mean. So the reason I say, share that is because even though I went there feeling like maybe I would, you know, I would have something to offer or I would teach them something. It was just like exactly the opposite. Like they were showing me what it meant to, to use art, to transform a space, to use your voice, to use prayers. And then, and all, and the, and the underlying feeling was just this real profound sense of connection and unity. So, 
yeah, my exp- my experience in the prisons was was um, I think of it as kind of life changing in a way and transformative. Uh, it was very transformative. Yeah, yes. definitely. So we're going to take things back in time a little bit. Your parents were both artists and lived quite adventurous lives. By the age of five, you'd already lived in Australia, Canada, Fiji, Greece, England, just to name a few countries. And after some time apart, you joined your father, who had learned about the Baha'i faith not long after becoming a Methodist pastor in Saskatchewan. Mm-hmm. By the age of 16, you'd quit school with the intention of driving down to Belize, but ended up in mm-hmm. California pursuing a music career. Could you elaborate <laughs> on your upbringing and the conditions surrounding your father's discovery of the Baha'i faith and how that's impacted your creativity and journey uh, through adolescence and adulthood? Yeah, well, um, so my parents met on this commune in a place called Sointula um, in BC. And then, yeah, I, I, they had me in Alert Bay. Um, and then when I think, I think I was about 18 months when they moved to Australia. And so my mom comes from a fairly big family. And, and anyway, so we lived in Sydney for a while. But at that time, my parents were um, very, you know, they were, they were really testing the traditions that they had been born into. So you know, they just, they were really experimenting with everything. And, and, um, and it was a very tumultuous time, uh, in Australia. And then my dad at some point decided that he wanted to leave. And actually my grandparents begged my mom and dad not to take me. They said, you guys are completely messed up. Um, you know, you don't have a clue what you're doing. Just leave him with us. We'll raise him. We'll take care. (laughs) But that's not what happened. They left and yeah, I was in Fiji. And, um, anyway, so they lived, they lived in, uh, we lived there for a little while. Yeah. So we ended up, uh, from Australia in Greece, um, where my dad was working on a fishing boat, a prawn fishing boat and, and then, and then, uh, all over Europe and then in, into England, uh, London, where my mom was working as a teacher in a free school and my dad was working as a carpenter. Anyway, uh, long story short, my f- parents ended up back in Canada and got divorced uh, right away. And then my dad, he ended up in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, where he went into a drug and alcohol um, treatment center and became a born again Christian. They, they were grooming him to be a leader in this church because he was so good at, at proselytizing or like getting out there on the street and in AA meetings and in the prisons. And, and uh, Jesus was very active and, and the church was expanding. But then he came across this, this book uh, called Baha'u'llah in the New Era and started to cross-reference passages that he was reading from the writings of Baha'u'llah with writings from the Bible. And after doing this for a, a few, maybe like six weeks or two months or something, he came to the conclusion that Baha'u'llah was the fulfillment of these prophecies in the Bible. So he went to his church and he said to the church elders, you know, I have some really important news. I want to call a meeting and I really, I have to, I have, I have something to tell all of the elders of the church. And so they, they convened this meeting and he sat down he said, you know, I've been studying, I, I've been reading the Bible. And I, and I think that the, the fulfillment of these prophecies has occurred and that Baha'u'llah is the, is the, is the fulfillment of the prophecies of Isaiah and, you know, coming of the second coming and all this stuff. And so the elders of the church said, you have two weeks to cast Satan out of your heart. And if you can like figure out your program, you know, you're welcome to stay in the church. But if you continue with this after two weeks, you know, you'll be excommunicated from this church. So anyway, in two weeks he came back and he had his books and he was hoping that they maybe would, would drill, drill him on, on these things and they didn't. And so he said, you know, you're, 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 this is a big opportunity, you know, you're missing out on this. And so he was excommunicated and we left that house and we got moved into this apartment and different things. And the interesting thing about my experience then was this happened when I was about six and seven years old is that at that time in Saskatchewan, there was a lot of um, teaching amongst indigenous people, a lot of um, Baha'is who were going to reserves and different things. What happened was we lived in this little house on Winnipeg Street, a two-story house, and it just filled up with indigenous youth, like 
30, 30 youth at, at any given time. Yeah. So my, so my, my life uh, as a kid, as a Baha'i was also very much tied up in my dad's work with um, teaching the faith and with um, kind of the early beginnings of this community building process that, that we're that we're engaged in more now but at that time in regina there were a lot of indigenous youth and and i grew up in that environment wow what a unique story and upbringing so at the age of 20 you decided to enroll in university for the first time you started out in documentary filmmaking, if I'm not mistaken, then majored in English, which you'd hoped would lead you into a career in journalism, but instead introduced you to studies in fine arts and painting. So what prompted you to go to university in the first place? And what were the influences or inspirations behind this shift from English to fine arts? So I was playing music and, and, and there was this really incredible environment where we would come together and have these firesides at our house. I moved in with a friend and we had this house and we'd play music in the basement and come up and people would be coming over. And sometimes there'd be like 30 people there, 40, like wall to wall people. Anyway, so doing this for a little while, um, I met my wife, Julie Rogers. And my, my wife now at the time, I, she was, had moved, she was in McGill studying uh, political science and she came to Saskatoon to study law. I met her and it was interesting when I met her, she was kind of like, I think she might have liked me a little bit or, or some interest, but I had zero, like, I don't know, like my life was so, I, I, I was, you know, I quit high school at 16. I was working as a waiter and I was just playing music. Like I, it's not like I didn't have direction, but I was kind of like a little bit lo still kind of lost in a way. So I sort of told her that I liked her and she was, she was like, yeah, not really interested. Um, but it prompted me to really think, well, what if I meet somebody who's just really great like this again, and I'm kind of still just living in a basement suite, working as a doing room service. Like, so that's when it, that was part of my, the thing that prompted me to, to get my act together. But at the same time, when I met her, she had this really beautiful apartment and it was covered with her dad's paintings, Otto Rogers. And when I first saw those paintings, I felt like they were, they were from another world or from like this, this beautiful place that, that I had heard about, but I'd never, I'd never seen. And then when I saw her, like all of the things that I was describing to you about the Baha'i faith, like the, the kind of spirit and the, and the feeling um, of being on pilgrimage or this, this connection that I had with indigenous people people as a kid they were somehow embedded in those paintings like like the paintings were were, were giving voice to something about this the mystical spiritual nature of reality and i really wanted to understand what they, what they were saying and i didn't understand them like it was like a foreign language that i i like the sound of it like when you hear persian for the first time or arabic it's like i like the sound but i don't know what the words mean so part of my my um meeting julie and wanting to get my act together uh, was also this feeling of, oh, I, I think I'd like to go to university and maybe take some art courses. And so I, I enrolled at the University of Saskatchewan to study. I thought I'd be a journalist. And then I was taking English classes. And then I took art classes as, a, as an elective. And that's when I um, realized that I'd, the first painting class I took was with a, actually another Baha'i who was teaching it, Lorenzo Dupuy beautiful artist and amazing guy in Saskatoon. He was my first painting teacher. And um, from the very first class, I knew that's, it was like, okay, this is what I want to do with my life. <laughs> um, which was funny with Julie too, because she was like, you know, I don't care what you do for a living, but just do not become an artist. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went to university and I, and I studied uh, and, and I had this, this encounter with Don's paintings, Otto's paintings. And, uh, and they, that really was sort of the impetus for, for wanting to study art. And, and then I worked in an art gallery and they had a lot of his paintings there too. And I would, I would sort of study them as well. Um, you know, I would just, I would spend time looking at them and, and thinking about them and it, yeah so when i was i think this is about when i was about 20 years old and uh it was life-changing again for me that encounter 
Hmm. So for many listeners who are not aware, Otto Don Rogers was a renowned Canadian abstract artist and Baha'i who actually had various leadership roles in the Baha'i community throughout his life and um, recently passed away. But Otto Don Rogers was a huge influence on on your own work, Sky, and um, I, and also became later became your father in law. Um, now I know that you've explored working in so many different mediums as an artist. So I'm curious to know what your journey has been like in terms of finding your own voice. What's been the driving force? Uh, behind your willingness to take risks and establish your own rhythm and mode and op- uh, approach? And how has the Baha'i faith played a role in all of this? My work has been characterized by kind of jumping around and experimenting with a lot of things. But I think that's part of um, my response to the faith, or the Baha'i faith in a way, because for a number of years, I, I was really what you, I would describe myself as a painter. Um, and I lived in um, Saskatoon, and then we moved to Amsterdam, and I was, you know, really studying painting. And when I moved back to Canada, um, I continued to show uh, mostly paintings. And uh, anyway, I had really characterized my practice by really focusing on painting, but I had a kind of a, a crisis. Um, I was working on these paintings, and and selling them. And then at one point I, I realized I didn't want to do them anymore. Like I wasn't, I wasn't learning anything from them. Uh, I wasn't interested in what I was saying. I was kind of just going through the motions. Um, and so as a way of trying to, um, I don't know what the word is, but as kind of as a last ditch effort to figure out how to um, move forward, I just stopped painting and I started experimenting with, with sculpture and with printmaking and with collage and with um, assemblage and installation and photography. I just started, like I decided at that moment, you know, I can't keep going on in in this way. So I began to really just see what would happen is I'd go into the studio and I would be stuck and I wouldn't be able to make anything. I was like paralyzed. And then I would sit around in my studio for like sometimes all day and then I would just walk home. And this went on for about three months where I'd go to the studio and I just really couldn't do anything. So in order to sort of um, reignite something within me, I began, I thought, you know, the only way to do this is with my hands. I can't do it with my mind. My mind is, is not the helping right, me here. Right. So I began to do these little sculptures using blocks, you know, like almost like Lego just gluing them together and painting them and then casting them in plaster and then carving into them. And I just got really um, into this, this process of, of using my hands to, to, to just explore the creative potential of object or material. And that's what led me to uh, explore these different avenues. And then after doing that for a little while, I realized the creative, the creative um, spirit is what art is a manifestation of. It's not just a product. It's not just a painting or just a drawing. Like those are aspects of the creative spirit. So for me, the, the energy or the, the thesis or the, the idea, the focus wasn't so much on what I was making, but how I was making, like how my body felt, how my hands felt. Uh, if, if, and then I got super excited. So instead of coming to the studio and like not being able to work, I had a hundred things on the go. You know, I had a sculpture I was making out of glass and I had a sculpture that I was making out of steel, uh, like, like found steel and then collages and then diazo prints and drawings. And it was like this explosion. And I realized the explosion was letting go of worrying about what the thing would look like mm. and just allowing my body and my hands to just just to have some freedom to 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 mm, explore. Yeah, I feel like this is the perfect time in this interview to kind of now delve more into your work and explore this intersection between um, the spiritual and and the creative practice. 
So you've had some really prolific exhibitions that intrinsically bind your creative work and exploration with your belief in Baha'u'llah. In particular, your show's background, display, and what is a self. Could you walk us through these shows and how they spoke to your family's narrative and your own sense of identity and spiritual relationship with faith? So the first show that I that I did was called Background. And just like we talked about in this podcast uh, about my dad becoming a Baha'i when I was seven, I took that as the starting point for this show. And so I, I flew back to Moose Jaw where, where my dad was, and I and I not to go too far into it, I, I took that moment of crisis in a sense of identity that my dad had when I was seven, that changing point from that kind of hippie communal, you know, drug adult uh, child like parents a childhood to when my dad became a Baha'i as this kind of like this kind of um, fulcrum you know this turning point and then I and a lot of the experiments that I was doing in the studio at that time whether it be you know collaging or drawing or whatever I was also looking at my early childhood you know weaving a kind of a narrative around uh, identity and so that that process of like experimenting with materials and then searching for identity has really become the focus of my art. When we try to imagine ourselves in the world, we tend to think of ourselves as like, you know, uh, autonomous, free thinking, kind of like computers on a stick. You know, like our body is kind of like a stick and the computer is kind of like the the, the central command center. But Heidegger makes this case that when we're born, we're born into a background. We're born into a language, a culture, a time, a gender, a race, a nationality. Like there's this infinite array of embedded meaning that you're born into before you even begin to speak. You're just, you're in it. And the reason that why this is important is because he said the most the most dramatic elements of your identity are things that you will never be able to define or see because they're, they're, they're behind what you see. They're, they're actually creating the context by which you can see. So there's no way to sort of step back outside of this equipmental totality, he refers to it as, to see what you're embedded in. But he said there are moments when it when it becomes more transparent or more uh and those moments are moments of crisis so like a drug addict you know hitting bottom for example you might give you some kind of sense of who you are like like where am i going you know what's going on in my life like those moments with a deep soul searching kind of are, are a bit of a glimpse so anyway in that show background i was triangulating something. I was looking at a three-way, like a trinity. I was looking at myself, my identity, my, my sense of who I am, and my father, and, 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 his, and, and, and my father, not just my father, but the concept of a father. Uh, and then the, the, the last one was as abstraction and like modernity and the, and the relationship between spiritual, spiritualism or spirituality and abstraction. So those three things were, were kind of being kind of like um, poles or, or, or like a triad and that I was exploring in that show. And so there were, there were drawings of like early Baha'is. There was a drawing of my mother. There was like Alcoholics Anonymous and all this stuff. And basically what I was trying to do in that show was to, to reverse the modality of abstraction. And it was a way of trying to make art relevant for me. And then with the next show, it was called Display. And what, what I did with that show was a similar kind of process, but instead of looking just at my own identity and my own background, I was thinking about the, this fledgling Baha'i community in Canada and, I, and, and how difficult it is sometimes when someone asks you, you know, what is, a, what is the Baha'i faith? You know, what, what do you believe? Because as soon as you start putting it into like, well, we believe in the oneness of humanity and we believe that all religions are one, and, you know, it just sounds like every other kind of thing in a way. But when you actually get to know Baha'is and you see the struggle uh, of trying to I implement these teachings into your life, you realize this is like a Herculean monumental struggle. Anyway, so the image that I found was, was of, a, of a little display booth at the Canadian National Exhibition in, in Toronto in 1963. And 
I took this little image, which is probably only about two inches by three inches or something. And I blew it up, as you mentioned earlier, seven by four feet. And then, and then I put a grid over top of that image that was two millimeters by two millimeters. So what happens is as you get close to the drawing, all you can see is this grid, this screen of dots and lines. But then as you move away, you see the image. But that screen of dots and lines took me nine months to draw. And I had four studio assistants also working on it. So it was this incredibly laborious kind of meditation. And the drawing was really like the impossibility of representing the Baha'i community in an image or the impossibility of representing my faith in an image. But the process, like those dots, reflect something about time, about meditation, about ritual, about pain. And then the image is, is in some ways becomes quite secondary to the process. So it's always this balance for me between the process and the image and how they inform one another. So that, that uh, large drawing fed a bunch of other works in that show uh, that were, were more abstract in nature, more about process and more about kind of relationships. So th those are those two shows. And the last one you mentioned, What is a Self, was a large exhibition I had at a museum in Oakville. And, and I won't go too deep into it because of the time, but it was exploring this, all of these same themes, but the really dominant um, uh, modality was the hand. And, the, and then the interior. So like I was creating furniture and weavings and paintings and sculptures to populate a house, you know, kind of like you inhabit a house. And so the metaphor there was the interior of this house being kind of like the interior of a, of a person, interior space. So I created this bookshelf, but it wasn't a real bookshelf. It, it, it held objects like pots and and plaster carvings and weavings. And it was all like a bookshelf that could contain my creative process. So it was an exploration of interior space, like a moral space, like a moral inventory. Uh, and that show was in four rooms, four sort of large ro rooms in this estate. Um, and it was all about, like I said before, about the hand and about um, craft and really, when you when you ask what's the relationship between religion or being a Baha'i and the creative process, for me, that show was an exploration of that. Um, it was it was a, it was a chance for me to think about how an artist um, goes about exploring his or her creative identity um, and how that impacts their sense of who they are. That's why I called it "What Is a Self." It's a, it's a, it, is a, it is a question, like, like we know we have a self, but what does it look like? What is it? What is it made of? What is it made of? And, and so anyway, that, the house became kind of like a metaphor for um, inter my interior. Mm. And uh, it was a really kind of an exhausting show. It took two years. Wow. Um, um, I mean, it seems like you were really vulnerable in these shows and that you really embraced that freedom to be curious and that's such for truth. I'm, I'm curious to know what the public and your colleagues thought about these exhibitions and your like your vulnerability to wear your faith on your sleeve. Yeah, I was worried, but I was also kind of um, I couldn't go on. So I was just I, I just I just embraced the fact that, you know, I really didn't have a choice. Right. You know, right. if people if people responded to it in a negative way, that was the price I had to pay. It wasn't. But the interesting thing is that didn't happen at all. My my colleagues and my um, fellow artists, for the most part, like the people that I'm engaged with, uh, my friends and colleagues, they were all very supportive. Actually, I was really sh surprised because the art world is a very secular, very left leaning, very secular kind of a, a, a space. And I thought that these these issues would be met with a certain degree of suspicion or or out, outright rejection but that that didn't happen at all i i found I, I had a huge i actually think my work got more uh the more vulnerable and the more open i made it the the better the response was for the most part and i'm, I'm actually really grateful for for the way the art community allowed me 
to ask some of these questions that I needed to ask, you know, and, uh, and really supported me for the most part. Um, artists are quite, um, open-minded you know mm. and they were just giving me the benefit of the doubt that's so awesome um i've met a lot of artists who are people of faith but they like to keep their art separate from from spirituality and are, are afraid to bring that their, their faith into this kind of space so what's your advice to them like i think we're way too worried about what people will think and i find that most of the time people are pretty cool you know like they're pretty open like um, so I think Baha'is can be more audacious. We're very worried about what other people will think. We don't want to offend anybody. You know, we, we really, we really try to keep our, 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 our faith kind of under wraps in a way, you know, and, and, and for good reason, I think too, because I think religion has been exploited, you know, uh, relig- the, the, the language of religion has become very politicized and very, uh, um, fractured and d- 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 um, divisive so as baha'is we we don't want to add to that that cacophony of yelling fanatic fanatic voices we want to, we want to promote dialogue and and community and and we want to we want to create a, a really genuinely inclusive kind of space but at the same time there's nothing wrong with just coming out with what you believe and and in part i think it's because people need these teachings it's not like it's not like we're you know we come up with what we believe and then all of a sudden we've we've harmed the world it's like these teachings are really exciting and radical and beautiful and And timely yeah like when people hear what 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 the words of baha'u'llah for example you know nine times out of ten they're like oh my goodness that's the most beautiful you know idea and things so i think it's worth being a bit risky uh, f- from the standpoint of you're a musician or an artist or something and just kind of like being really clear about what you're exploring. I think people are much more receptive than we give them credit for. Absolutely. Now, Abdul Baha said, I rejoice to hear thou takest pains with thine art. For in this wonderful new age, art is worship. The more thou strivest to perfect it, the closer wilt thou come to God. What bestows could be greater than this? that one's art should be even as the act of worshipping the Lord. That is to say, when thy fingers grasp the paintbrush, it is as if thou were at prayer at the temple. So Sky, could you walk us through your creative process and the spiritual aspects that connect you with the Creator and bring you to a state of prayer? Well, that's one of my favorite quotes. I have that written out um, and put him in my prayer book. You know, it was written to Mark Toby. Abdul Baha wrote that, but Mark Toby was this radical, inventive, modernist, abstract painter. And rather than like Abdul Baha writing to him, like, you know, what are you doing making these crazy, radical, totally abstract, weird paintings? He was he was describing what Mark Toby was doing as worship. And um, and I think that sentiment is something that will reverberate for centuries through the Baha'i community. I, th- I don't think we've, we've come to terms with it at all, what that means, that when you pick up your paintbrush, it's as if you're entering the temple. I think that that's just a really, really profoundly moving idea. Um, but I'll tell you, it comes at a cost, so to speak, in that you can think that everything you do is like an act of worship, which it is, but that doesn't mean that the product is always perfect, right? Like just because you have this beautiful tool to express something profound and meaningful, it doesn't mean that everything you do is going to look spiritual, you know, like look perfect. And as a painter, I'm always trying to look at um, how the materials themselves, like the paint or the, or the, or the canvas, how it actually is is almost like a metaphor for the physical right it's like it's the thing you're grappling with and you have to take you have to take it seriously and you have to really become like almost like a lover of of the physical in order to sort of like let that language evolve and whether it becomes spiritual or not i think that's for people to you know that's for history to decide i think when it happens it's kind of like a a tiny little miracle Mm. And maybe a lifetime's worth of effort, you get that a few times. 
I'm curious about your thoughts on whether the receiver of the art, like the observer, can experience the spiritual even with like an untrained ear or eye. Can they experience that connection to the divine like you did the first time that you saw Dawn's painting? One of the cool things about the faith, the Baha'i faith, is that we're trying to develop people's, we're trying to develop our capacity so like even though spir- the spiritual that you you talk about is is really the core of reality for us in order to express it requires a huge amount of education and learning and trial and error and and sacrifice so just because a concept exists doesn't mean we have access to it in a really profound way it requires education it requires time it requires effort so I think the same is true of painting. Like I'm just now sort of understanding certain things within painting that I've been studying for 30 years. So like when I go to a museum, you know, and I look at a painting by Matisse, I'm seeing things that I didn't see 30 years ago. And I'm realizing things that I, I, I could only realize because I dedicated my life in a way to that language. So that's not to say that the average person couldn't just come in and look at that painting and be inspired by it. But it's like anything. If you really want to to allow it to permeate into your exist into your reality, uh, you you have to. It's like there's an educational process that needs to take place. And so one of the things about the faith is you know Baha'i faith is we're actually really concerned about allowing this educational process. Um, we're concerned with opening it up to everybody so that even so in a neighborhood like in Vancouver, where you are, where, where youth like young junior youth and youth are learning about beauty. You know, that's one of the core elements of the junior youth program is beauty. So how, how amazing is that to think that a generation of young people could, could explore these concepts so that by the time they're, they're adults and, and they have children, they, they can actually imbue the environment that they're in with this concept of beauty, but it requires education. It requires effort. It requires sacrifice. What you just said with that quote, when you read that quote about when you enter the the studio, you know, pick up the brush, it's like worship. I think we have to treat what we do with that sacred kind of that sense of it really matters. It really is important that we, you know, like that we give it everything we can. And if it works great, but the thing, and if it doesn't work, that's fine. Because the, the critical thing is, are we learning? Like, are you getting, you know, each day, are you learning something? Are you getting a little closer mm. to your goal? And also, how are we accompanying others along this path? Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. How are we learning together? So these, to me, that's kind of more important than whether or not something looks really, you know, great or looks like it could look really terrible. But you learn something amazing mm. in that. Mm. Definitely, definitely. Well, Sky, we've just come to the end of our episode. We're almost out of time, but I just wanted to um, touch base with you. Uh, you and I are both in social isolation. We're in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. There's a lot of fear um, and uncertainty in the world. Um, a lot of prayers for healing and protection are, are being shared and um, spread throughout the world. Is there anything in relation to this pandemic and the Baha'i faith that you've been reflecting on recently that you could share with us in closing this interview? Well, yeah, like um, since the beginning of this crisis, I mean, you know, getting a lot of people writing me about different aspects of the coronavirus and blah, blah, blah. And and part of me, I'm kind of, uh, I'm a little bit exhausted ab- about that. <laughs> so I've been looking for things that can contribute to that, but that are a little bit more about this process of disintegration and integration that humanity is grappling with. Like certain things are falling apart, but certain things are being born. And I found this quote and it was from um, the priceless pearl that I've been reading it again, because I find the, the example of Shoghi Effendi, you know, the grandson of, of Abdul Baha, I found the, I, I just get a lot of, um, 
inspiration from the, the example of Shoghi Effendi, but especially in times of crisis. So anyway, this was um, a passage that Shoghi Effendi's wife, Rahia Kanum, had, had quoted in that book. And it says, however severe the challenge, however multiple the tasks, however short the time, however somber the world outlook, however limited the material resources of a hard-pressed adolescent community, the untapped sources of celestial strength from which it can draw are measureless in their potencies and will unhesi unhesitatingly pour forth their energizing influences if the ne necessary daily effort be made and the required sacrifices be willingly accepted. So I just love this, this passage of um, untapped sources of celestial strength from which it can draw are measureless. And I think given that we can't go out as much and, and uh, given that we're quite isolated in some ways, we're still trying to maintain a dialogue with, with people around us. And I think um, we really need at this time, almost more than ever, to tap into those sources of celestial strength. And then also to uh, make the, the daily effort and the required sacrifices I think this idea of what is it that we need to do and what are the sacrifices that we, we need to make, um, these are the things that resonate with me right now in terms of working through this next kind of critical juncture that humanity is facing. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sky, for joining us on Cloud9. This has been such a rich conversation at such a critical and... Uh, crazy time that we're in to you've raised a lot of very um poignant concepts that we can all kind of reflect on and think about and address in our own daily lives in the coming weeks and months as we're actively trying to isolate ourselves um and and really reflect on the meaning of of all of of all of this um, so thank you so much for your time today, Sky, and we really look forward to catching up with you in the future and learning more about um, your your creative process and what you've been working on. Well, it was really my pleasure. Thanks so much for, for the opportunity. Thanks so much for listening to Cloud9. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to check out Baha'iTeachings.org where you can find more Baha'i-inspired podcasts, videos, and articles.